You are listening to the Dark Fantastic Podcast. Welcome to this new episode of the Dark Fantastic Podcast. This is a special episode dedicated to music. And I've got a few things lined up for you. Some very special things. And as usual, a new short story. So stay tuned and let's begin. Musical tastes are a very personal thing. You might like one album because it reminds you of a moment in time or a favorite memory, maybe standing on the beach as a kid, partying with friends as a teenager, holding hands with someone at a friend's wedding or engagement party. It's a very personal thing and it's very, very subjective. What music we like, what music we like to listen to, our favorite albums, these are things that are very different from one person to another. When people are happy, they like to listen to upbeat songs. When people are sad, When some people are sad, they like to listen to upbeat songs. Others like to listen to sad songs. Some people listen to the blues because to them, it fills them with joy. It's a positive kind of music. Some listen to the blues because of the storytelling in the songs. Others listen to the blues because it speaks to them. It reminds them of their problems and maybe how to overcome their problems. Or just maybe because it it fits their mood. So music types or music genres are different things to different people. Again, it's a very subjective thing. Music is, to repeat a cliché, the soundtrack to someone's life. But subjectivity aside, what makes an album timeless? What makes an album a favorite across the ages? What makes an album sound as fresh today as when it came out 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? What makes certain records impervious to the brutality of time? Whether you play an album on CD, on vinyl, on cassette, if it's a good album, you will like it. You will hear the timelessness of it despite the signal noise, despite the hiss. If it's a bad album, it ages on any format. There are some records that just don't age, technically as well as artistically. Some classical music seems to be immortal. Tchaikovsky, Beethoven, and Bach, for example, sound as majestic and otherworldly today as they must have sounded hundreds of years ago. But Telemann and Vivaldi haven't fared as well. Their compositions coming off as a bit quaint, and old, I guess, when you hear it now, which is the case with a lot of classical music. And again, it's a matter of taste, and also it's a matter of, I guess, what kind of music you listen to growing up, because to some people, classical music will always sound ancient, and music that 
that just captures a certain era that some people don't respond to or don't have the temperament to let themselves be transported by it. But even within classical music, as I just said, some compositions and the work of some composers age better than others. Almost everyone agrees that the greatest albums by the Beatles, for example, are not just ahead of their time, they seem to be ahead of time itself, age never catching up to their sounds, their voices, their compositions, and their energy. But there are a number of unsung heroes to consider. I've always been a fan of Brian Ferry's work, for example, and I listened to his work as a solo artist and as the main artist or band leader of Roxy Music. And I have a lot of favorites. Just recently, I rediscovered an album of his that I never really paid attention to called Another Time, Another Place which was released in 1974. It's made up of nine covers and one original, which is the title track. Ferry has always been the consummate musical craftsman. Most of his albums transcend time and place, and especially the albums he made in the 90s and the 2000s, like Mamuna and Frantic, they seem to get better with age. Unlike his solo albums from the 80s, Boys and Girls and Bette Noir, which have great songs, uh, and um, some of the songs sound as fresh today as when they came out over 30 years ago. But his albums from the 80s, the production, some of the programming, some of the instrumentation sounds very much of the time. But as I said, albums from the, the 90s and the 2000s seem to age better. But to my surprise, his album from 1974, Another Time, Another Place, sounds as fresh today as when it came out almost 50 years ago. It still sounds fantastic. The latest remastered version is a revelation. The arrangements, the instrumentation, and the use of piano and vocals transport the listener to, well, another time and another place. Highlights include his cover of the platter's Smoke Gets in Your Eyes, which is one of his standards now. He plays it almost always in his live shows. And uh, his take on Chris Christopherson's Help Me Make It Through the Night is also excellent. But Ferry has always been a somewhat unsung hero of modern popular music and rock music and glam rock music. He is a somewhat prolific artist and he has put out a lot of records, but for some reason a lot of people don't take his work as seriously as they should. And as time goes by and as his albums age very, very well and hold up, I think people should give his work another look. And a good starting point is Another Time, Another Place. Another timeless album is Folk Funk by Bobby Rush. Rush is also one of the most underrated musicians on the planet. 
His mastery of soul, blues, and funk is astounding, and his brand of folksy storytelling, catchy melodies, killer harmonica solos, and clean production is incomparable. He has put out dozens of records over his almost 60-year career, but Folk Funk, the album that came out in 2004, is a combination great, greatest hits album and basically a career, a career relaunch for Bobby Rush, showcasing his full range of tricks and styles. Highlights include Feeling Good, Parts 1 and 2, which are the opening track and the closing track, which do make the listener feel good. Another track is Uncle Esau, with its smooth slide guitar work, scorching harmonica solos, and wonderful storytelling. And of course, Chicken Heads, Refried, a polished re-recording of Rush's greatest hit, and the most well-known of all of his songs, aside from I Ain't Studying Ya, which was featured in many movies, including, uh, I think, Dolomite Is My Name, and uh, Black Snake Moan. The album is almost 20 years old now, and it doesn't show its age one bit. So put it on, turn it up, and lose yourself in a timeless bubble of pure funky joy. My guest on this episode is a musician, author, and music historian. He is the co-author of two acclaimed biographies, Maurice White, My Life with Earth, Wind and Fire, and I Ain't Studying Ya, the autobiography of the one and only Bobby Rush. He joins me on the show to talk about music, the blues, black history, and, of course, working with Bobby Rush. Please welcome Herb Powell. What records uh, made you fall in love with music as a kid? Oh, wow. Um, well, uh, Spinners. Fell in love with the Spinners early. All the Tom Bell stuff, the stylistics. Um, then, of course, Earth, Wind & Fire, which is a huge influence on me. Um, Steely Dan. Um, but when you're blessed with older brothers and sisters, they're always introducing you to music. Um, whether it was, um, you know, Motown or, for example, that Stylistics, that first album, my sister, Dot, uh, brought that into the house. Um, so in other words, the records that I fell in love with early on were gifts for my brothers and sisters because it was the music that they were listening to. And I just gravitated to certain records that I love. Um, so things like that. But mostly uh, as, as a, when I started, I started playing bass when I was 12. Um, and uh, that's a direct result from going to an Earth, Wind & Fire concert when I was 12 saying Verdi White and, um, and Earth, Wind & Fire knowledge in all of its majesty that really pushed me into music as a profession. So you were a musician first and then you became uh, basically a music historian. Uh, basically, um, I studied radio, TV and film in college. Um, I finished at Cal State LA out here in Los Angeles. Um, but before that, when I got out of high school, I was touring the Southeast with uh, General Johnson of Chairman of the Board had revitalized his early group called The Showman. And uh, they needed a bass player and I did that. So I toured the Southeast, what's called the Carolina Beach Music Circuit for about a year and a half 
before I went to Howard University in Washington for a year, and then I moved to California. Uh, so yes, I've been a musician most of my life. Um, uh, got into doing TV music underscore, you know, as computer technology came of age. And, um, and then uh, by chance, um, my mentor, uh, Maurice White, had been trying to write a book. He had gone through, I think, three or four writers, um, but could, they couldn't really get Maurice. Maurice was a, a kind of guy that if you didn't go through the portals of music or spirituality, he was a, a tough guy to reach. And, uh, and I'd known him some years um, because um, I had you know, done some work for him, um, music work uh, over in Japan in the 90s and stuff like that. And he called me one day and asked me what I write his book. I hadn't written any books. I had done some liner notes for a couple of Earth, Wind & Fire releases. Uh, but my dad being a minister, my mother being an English teacher, I wasn't um, averse, averse in any way to writing. And uh, we had a little agreement. I'd write half the book if he liked it. That would be great. Uh, and then we'd proceed. And he loved it. And we did proceed. So that really pushed me into writing um, full time. Speaking of Maurice White, you seem to be attracted to writing about Mavericks. You co-wrote the, the Maurice White's autobiography. And of course, Maurice White was a trailblazer, if ever there was one. And uh, your latest book is the autobiography of the great Bobby Rush, who is also a true original and who almost always does it his way. So what is it about this type of artist that attracts you? Well, it's really not that heavy. Um, if... Maurice hadn't called me, I wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> so it wasn't a thing that I chose to say I was going to write about this artist or that artist. Um, it was what was people called me. Um, and so it wasn't, I just was fortunate, you know, that Maurice is one of the most important figures in American music um, to uh, do his book. Um, and in terms of Bobby Rush, um, I got a call and um, I met with him. He came to Los Angeles. Uh, I met with him in Burbank for two successive nights, both after 11 p.m. I drove to his hotel up in Burbank and we talked and we hit it off. I listened and, and at the end of those conversations, I told him basically what I thought, what my thoughts for his book could be. And, you know, when you, when you do that stuff, you kind of, um, um, it's, it's such a great degree of uh, vulnerability for people to tell their life story. So there is a level of trust um, and some love involved where uh, just by the osmosis of doing the project. Um, so again, it wasn't that heavy. It was just who called me um, as it has it still is today, you know. I read a lot of, of biographies and autobiographies and uh, they usually, of course, the, the, uh, they are either ghostwritten or the co-author is, uh, is basically uh, mentioned. But in both books, uh, the autobiography of Maurice White and I Ain't Studying You by uh, Bobby Rush or Bobby, Ru Bobby Rush's autobiography, there is, you seem to be able to capture uh, their voices and... Uh, there is a confessional aspect to the books that, to put it one way, the books don't seem like canned, like a canned product. You know what I mean? Well, I appreciate that. Um, but um, what I do know is this, um, that I think I have a certain gift for drawing people out and getting them to speak honestly, and in the case of men, probably uh, more vulnerably than they would normally speak. Um, you know, for men, um, vulnerability is a thing that we're taught via the culture 
not to reveal. And um, so I think I do have a certain skill set to bring out those vulnerabilities. Um, and yet, and yet, and still, these are uh, two men who are all true men in every aspect of the word. Uh, but I do think that the vulnerability that's revealed on the pages um, is a testament to them and a testament to the trust that was established between us to, uh, to get the job done. Um, and I think that's what people appreciate about uh, both books. Um, both books were extremely well received, which I was really <laughs> grateful for, if not surprised. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, a lot of it, I think, is just the, the degree of male vulnerability um, that, um, that, I, that I try to bring out in, um, in those guys and, and others. I wanna. We'll, I'll get back to uh, Bobby Rush in, uh, in in a minute, but I just wanna talk to you uh, just a little bit about an interview uh, that I read uh, that uh, music journalist Scott Galloway uh, did with you uh, when the when Maurice White's autobiography came out. I'll just read a, a quote from that interview. Something you said. Uh, you said. One of my biggest problems with the media is the way it makes a fetish out of black people, black music, and black entertainment. They relegate black music to funk because that's in line with their caricature of black music. Now, since hip-hop has muddied the waters in terms of quote-unquote black authenticity, Tupac is blacker than Seal, Biggie is blacker than Maurice White because he's truer to the game. Maurice says it in the book, he's from the projects of Memphis, Tennessee, but that doesn't make his journey more authentic than Bill Parsons, who's from the suburbs, end quote. That's a blazing statement, and it's very, very, very insightful. So do you want to get into that a little bit? Well, I mean, I think the quote speaks for itself. Um, uh, Listen, um, the story of African-Americans in America, it's one of the most intriguing stories of history. Um, And when it comes to entertainment, um, uh, what is considered who's blacker, who's less black, it's kind of um, disingenuous to the individuality of African-Americans um, because we all are raised in different homes. We all come from different sets of the tracks. We all express ourselves differently. Um, I do think that some of the more sophisticated uh, what some would call sophisticated aspects of music um, is kind of put off. Or how can I say this? Um, um, it takes it takes more acceptance for people to see uh, black folks in those roles. Um, if you talk to people, let's say black conductors of uh, major symphonies, and there are a host of them. Uh, they will talk about just the degree of acceptance. This gets into the African-American story in America, but it also gets into what is credible. In other words, if an African-American from the same, from Columbia University walks into office versus a, um, a, a white brother or sister, same resume from Columbia University, that person comes in with a different set of baggage just because of their skin. Conversely, in music, um, I do think that sometimes um, they, want, they want to make what is um, more authentic. Uh, their, their ideas of what is authentic is just not necessarily true. Um, 
a lot of times, in, in especially in African American stories, this is beyond music stories. There has to be some darkness related to their genius. It can't just be that they studied hard, worked hard, mastered their craft. It has to be some dark sexual thing or something dark uh, with this aspect of their life and that blossomed their creativity. Sometimes that's true. A lot of times it's not. People just work hard. They learn their craft. They get lucky. Making in the music business is like winning the lottery. It's, it's, it's a crapshoot at best. So it's, it's more just about a question of balance of how we see what is Black authenticity. I want to get back to uh, your work with Bobby Roche. And uh, how did you work with Mr. Roche? How did the writing process uh, go? We just talked. I mean, uh, Bobby is an incredible, an incredible storyteller. I mean, incredible storyteller. I mean, can have you captivated um, by colors and scenes and what he was feeling, which made my job easy. So uh, these books are just written by, we, we just talk. And we had, uh, he came to LA often. We talked every time he came for a couple hours. We spent countless hours over the phone talking. But of course, I talked to his um, brother, his sister, his, his living siblings, most of them, I think. Um, you know, uh, talked to people who knew him, good friends. And you just kind of piece it together that way. Uh, again, you know, with, with Bobby in particular, um, he's a great storyteller. Um, he didn't have to be drawn out in any way. You ask a question, he, he, gives, you, he gives you stories. So it was, it's, again, it wasn't that heavy. It was just, it's a part of the, the job of, it's a part of my job to put his voice on paper. But in his case, he was a, um, a very open and honest person. Um, in regards to um, getting his story done. I want to tell you just a little bit uh, about how I discovered the music of Bobby Roche because I'm, I'm a lifelong fan of the blues. Uh, but actually, I discovered uh, Bobby Roche's music only a couple of years ago when mm -hmm. I saw a video of him performing Chicken Heads uh, at the Ground Zero Blues Club in, uh, in Memphis, I think. But it was just the first time I saw uh, saw him live on uh, in a video on YouTube, and to be honest, I'd never seen anything like it. Even for someone like me who's a, a lifelong fan of music of all kinds, and I thought his music was just felt fresh and exciting, and he was funny and full of joy, but also in full command of the, of the stage and his band all the time, and. Uh, uh, next thing, I went and found a copy of his uh, greatest hits album, Chicken Heads, which is uh, like, uh, I think, an ant anthology that goes back 50 years. It covers 50 years of his career. And I was just blown away and, and, uh, and went, on, went on from there to folk funk and raw, which I think is one of the best blues albums to come out in, in the past 20 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Just amazing album, mm -hmm. uh, raw. Anybody who hasn't listened to that album doesn't really understand what Mr. Rush is capable of with, with just his voice and, uh, and, and an acoustic guitar and, an, and, a, and a harp. Mm -hmm. So after going through all that and listening to all that and taking all that in, I kept wondering how this man wasn't more well-known in the mainstream because... He's a terrific musician, composer, performer. He's very funny. He's, as you said, he's, a, he's basically a, an amazing storyteller. And uh, he says about himself that he's part musician, part stand-up comedian. And he's just an amazing uh, artist. So I know he's gotten more re recognition in, like, in the past 10 years or so, and he won a Grammy finally. But why do you think he's so underrated? 
Well, um, I do think, and he talks about this in the book, um, he made certain choices. Um, in the 70s, when um, Black music, because of multi-track recording and a host of other factors, mainstream Black music entered um, its, prop, its most lushful, diverse period, you know, um, from, you know, the bands, you know, black bands are pretty much gone from the record business today. They're none, you know, that are making any noise. Uh, he, when, when music changed, a lot of the blues uh, greats went to Europe. Bybee did not. And again, he talks about this uh, very eloquently in the book. Um, he can't tell you why he didn't, whether it was fear or uh, didn't want to change, but he chose to invest in the juke joints and, ch and chilling circuit that he came up in. So, for example, and again, this is in the story, uh, if you go to YouTube and see videos of blues artists from the 60s, whether it's Muddy, Sonny Boy Williamson, um, all those greats, unless it's the Newport Jazz Festival, most of that, that video footage will be from Europe. Okay. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that there was more respect for the genre of blues in Europe than in America for 20 plus years. Some would say that still exists today. Um, and I think Bobby, by his choice not to go to Europe, was a victim of that choice. That's why he's not known as much as so many others. There's a story he tells about Luther Allison. You know how Luther Allison, you know, who's one of the great seminal guitar players, underrated in terms of his just his force as a musician. Um, you know, went over to Europe because he couldn't find any work here in America. Um, so it, it's an old story, but again, one of the reasons to, to answer your question properly is that he chose not to go to Europe. And it was, he says, was a mistake, and it probably was in terms of Bobby Rush being known more in America and worldwide because most of the great blues artists were going over to Europe. I've watched a lot of interviews with, uh, with Mr. Rush, and uh, as you can tell, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Um, and he mentioned something very interesting. He, mentioned, he mentions it more than once in more than one interview. Uh, he says that blues, the blues doesn't really get as much respect now as it usually did, especially by the younger generation of black musicians. He says that, he, he doesn't say everybody, of course, he, I don't think he generalizes, but he says that younger black musicians now, even who are, who are, who can be described as, you know, somewhat uh, into the blues a little bit in their music, they seem to distance themselves from from the blues do you agree with that assessment and why and if you agree why do you think that is um well i do think it is a natural fact that um you know the blues are america's indigenous music okay it is a music that is indigenous to america and just like um uh, hmm, this is hard to say. Um, sometimes we don't, res uh, speaking as an African-American now, uh, we don't respect our roots as much as others do. Uh, for example, uh, the, the Led Zeppelins, the, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, are revered today, revered. Um, but it's, you know, yes, Aretha Franklin is revered. Um, the great late Aretha Franklin, Marvin Gaye is revered. Um, but in terms of the blues, I think that it just, Bobby talks about this in the book 
go. He says, uh, we lost the ladies. I think that's the chapter. And what he's talking about that when women started to gravitate in terms of the romantic ballads of the late 60s and early 70s to singing groups, those great singing groups that I mentioned, the temps, the stylistics, all that stuff, and didn't see the blues as a romantic music. That was a shift, and that shift is playing its played itself out, or it's playing itself out historically in terms of how people revere the blues. I, I think there, you know, there are other more complicated questions about who writes history, who um, who tells us what is this is black or white? Who tells us what is the history of American music? I think that's a deeper question, more complicated question. Um, uh, but I do know that uh, to to get answer your question specifically, I just think it's that's just it's just the nature of things. It's um, the blues is seen as old music. It will start to see that in the early 70s. It was the music of old people. It was the music of uh, people who conked their hair and not the Afro. It became less cool. It became more Southern, more down home. It became less sophisticated. It became less a part of the big cities. It was more country. And that's when um, I, I think that was the turn and the blues never really recovered after that. It's, uh, I know it's a complicated question because it is a complicated subject, I think. And the, the, the blues, uh, of course, it's, the blues will never go away. The blues will never die. But the blues, like Bobby Rush always says, if you don't like the blues, you don't like your mama. So <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just the root of, I think, of all basically popular music. And I'm not saying anything new. Of course, I'm just, I'm basically saying cliches now. That's why I, I keep, you know, going around this this topic because I just wish the blues, you know, reigned supreme a bit more because it's just, uh, it speaks it speaks to me. It speaks to a lot of people I know from all backgrounds. You don't you don't have to be someone from a, from a particular background to like the blues. The blues is just it's just it's poetry. It's romantic. It's it's about overcoming. It's about it's you know the, you know I mean, you know what I'm talking about. So yeah, yeah. I wish more people kn- uh, knew about the blues. I wish more young people uh, discovered the 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 you know the, the vastness of what the blues is. And I and that's why I, I'm always preaching about your book and and and, uh, and there's an audio book version of, of your book with Bobby Rush, which is great also. Uh, and uh, I'm always preaching about your book and about Bobby Rush's music because I think he's so, you know, versatile, and he and his uh, his music, what he calls folk funk, I think is is like a, a good entry into into the rich, uh, you know, the, the the rich range and the wide range of what the blues is. Uh, so that's why I think Bobby Rush should, if if he was known more and uh, I, I hope he, he will always, you know, gain more and more and more and more fans. Uh, but I think he's the perfect artist because he always keeps changing. You know, he keeps adding and uh, he's made all kinds of records, you know. So, but anyway, I, uh, I, dig- uh, I digress. But, uh, you know, I'm a bit passionate about this topic. So, um, <laughs> are you doing but, fine? <laughs> uh, um, uh, so what are you working on now? Uh, a couple things. Uh, most of them I can't mention. I finished a book with um, uh, Curtis Mayfield's wife who died of cancer some months back. But I finished that book a year ago. I think that's coming out in the spring of next year. Uh, very much a woman's story. Um, it, yes, it's, it, yes, of course, Curtis is laced within it, of course, but it's very much a Black woman's story of um, growing up as a foster child in Chicago and uh, meeting Curtis, having, I think, seven kids with him. And uh, that story, and of course, it's a caregiving book um, because, you know, Curtis was a quadriplegic for the last 10 plus years of his life. And um, 
so doing that, uh, working on a book with a um, with a baseball player whose mother was involved in the civil rights movement, and um, uh, you know, and it's a couple of things in development, you know, and still working on music and just plugging away. What about your music? Uh, do, do, do you, I do a lot of into. Yeah, I do a lot of music for TV, um, and um, uh, st- you know, still do that quite a bit. A lot of what's called underscore um, for TV shows. Um, it's a volume business. It's a, I have a little music house uh, I own, and uh, they sell music for television shows. And um, you know, uh, and I just continue to. Uh, I just did a, a big essay on Billy Preston. He was inducted into the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year. I did the essay for um, his induction uh, in the book. Um, I also did a um, thing with the, the, what I'm really proud of. Um, I was a historian on uh, Bruce Toleman funk and soul photographs, 72 to 82. Uh, that's out in Tash, uh, by the coffee table book Tashin. Uh, that's that's been out for two or three years, but it continues to do well, and it's really the only photo book of R and B music from 1972 of the great heyday of R and B. So really proud of that, and um, and then there's some other things that I'm working on. You know, I'm, I'm consulted on a couple Netflix things and. Just trying to keep it moving, as they say. I don't want to take too much of your time, but this has just been amazing. I've been trying to reach you for uh, for a while now. You're a hard man to reach, Herb. Um, well, I, you know, I don't mean that. You know, I don't really have a social media presence. I mean, I think if someone wants to find me, they can find me. I, um, you know, uh, I just I try to just all of my work is word of mouth, so. I'm not uh, that big because uh, and, and I always have stuff to do. So it's not like I'm crying out for work. <laughs> I just, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but I, I, I apologize. It was hard to reach me. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just, yeah. I'm just saying, as you said, basically because you don't have uh, much of a social media presence, which is, which is now, you know, it has made, it has made people like me and journalists and writers lazy because Basically, we used to hunt down the contacts, you know, and now it's just we you go to the Facebook page or the Twitter account and yeah. you directly contact the, uh, the the artist or the person you want to talk to. Yeah. But you made me go back, you know, to the uh, to the old school of doing things, which is great. I love it. <laughs> and, uh, and it makes and it makes this uh, much more, uh, you know, precious and uh, it, 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 uh, it makes this talk uh, you know, much more of value, I think, because uh, you made me work for it unintentionally, of <laughs> course, but, uh, but I enjoyed uh, talking with you very, very much. I don't want to take uh, more of your time. And I'm really grateful that you, that you came on the show. And uh, really, really thank you. Thank you. Herb. Uh, thank you, AK. Blessings on you and your endeavors, okay? Thank you very much. Special thanks to A. Scott Galloway, for making this interview possible. I'd like to end this episode with a poem by Shelley. It's called Music When Soft Voices Die and it's read by Leonard Wilson and this version is taken from the LibriVox website and you can download this and many other Shelley poems from the site. So thanks for listening and please join me again for another episode of the Dirk Fantastic Podcast. Music, when soft voices die, vibrates in the memory. 
Odors, when sweet violets sicken, Live within the scents they quicken. Rose leaves, when the rose is dead, Are heaped for the beloved's bed. And so thy thoughts, when thou art gone, Love itself shall slumber on. You've been listening to The Dark Fantastic Podcast. Flashes in the dark. Tiny stories. Vast dimensions. The wind. He played his instrument, letting the music flow. He stood in the street, alone, the wind caressing him, gently carrying the notes to lovers, far and near. He closed his eyes, sensing a change coming. The chords changed, the melody shifted. From a song of love it turned, into a song of longing. He opened his eyes, letting go, as the wind carried the notes away. Into many nights. Text copyright Ahmed Khalifa, 2021. Ahmed Khalifa is a filmmaker and novelist. He is the writer-director of several short films and a feature, released on Netflix, and the author of a number of novels and short stories, including, Beware the Stranger, available on Amazon. Summer. 1990. A teenage boy in trouble. An evil that only comes out at night. Only a straight-to-VHS movie can save him. From A. Kale, the author of, Beware the Night. Bad Dreams. A thrilling horror novel, now available on Amazon. Rated PG-13, for some thematic elements and mild violence.